So, Ryan Duns, thanks very much once again for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Uh, so we are just going to have a general discussion, really, about theology and horror and, I guess, sacramental stuff and spooky stuff and the overlap between the divine and the what you consider the yeah, horror and the horrific. And we sort of we discussed this because you were doing a course on theology and horror, which focused on the, the series by Netflix, Midnight Mass, along with a few other films, I believe. So we outlined a few films that we've watched, but I'm sure we're super familiar with anyway, which was the four films of Hellraiser, Exorcist 1 and 3, not 2, and then um, <laughs> and also Rosemary's Baby, which really I would say are the... If you were to ask anyone who's into horror, I'd say, give me four quintessential horror films. Those four are I would say are going to be there most of the time. And it's oddly coincidental that all four of them are so heavily reliant, if not basically need the divine to uphold why things are horrific, which is super, super interesting to me. Um, but before we dive into the questions which I've outlined, I just want to say, I, I want to ask, I guess, you did this course on theology and horror. I mean, where did it begin for you to start see, as, as a teacher to go, to sort of start thinking, hmm, okay, horror, there is clearly something very... Uh, clearly theological going on here and we should sort of pay attention to this as a cultural phenomenon. Sure. I, you know, teaching the course, I wanted to introduce my students to metaphysics hmm. and the best textbook I could find. And he, he was a teacher of mine was uh, Nuri Clark, the one in the many. And it happened such that I was, I had spent the summer before summer 2021 kind of reading through that book and it struck me that horror would be a really interesting and engaging way to, in, to, to, to meet the students and their questions. Preparing all fall to teach that class of fall of 21, I was, I was scrambling for a good, a good hook that would allow me to, to do this. And then I watched last October, Midnight Mass, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is a really theologically sophisticated series it doesn't get everything right and i don't follow it in all directions but where i find it going wrong it goes wrong in really interesting ways ways that i thought were theologically provocative mm -hmm. and my hope was and i think it succeeded based on the class evaluations and then the students have, as i've seen since then was to start to carve out a, a theologically sophisticated metaphysically rich world picture and to kick to allow the horror genre to kick against it to see what what kind of got you know tossed up a bit and mm -hmm. what types of questions do the horror films presuppose we as humans ask mm -hmm. and i have to say the students were phenomenal in doing this they really got into it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i guess the, the really big question for me with theology for horror, for the fact that it's still a mainstay of pretty much most horror films. And, and actually, when you think about it, the horror films which fall flat are the ones where really the, the, the monster was just a vicious human being, right? Like at the end, you find out they were just a killer. And I'm not saying that's not horrifying, but it's, I don't think it's, I think it's terrifying, but you're sort of like, oh, okay. Like we've seen that now and there's still, there's no unknown. So I'm, you just sort of run away and you think, yeah, that's just a serial killer. And there isn't this unknown element, so it's not really horrifying anymore. And so this, this, this within, you know, the, the banal cliche thing to say, we live in a secular society. It's undeniable. Most people are secular or atheist or would probably just apathetic, don't care. And yet, in the extremely popular genre of horror films, it's really odd to me that sacraments, that Christianity, that the divine is clearly still taken very sincerely as something where you enter into the, as soon as you click on the horror film it's almost like you got you're like right now now we're taking it seriously again um so yeah i put that question to you i mean why why do you think that is within this world where you suddenly go right crucifix crucifixes mean something again you know this is i'm just gonna because i was watching it minutes before we <laughs> began this the 1987 movie witchboard it's mm. Terrible. It's a terrible. I mean, it says its own cult following. The the beginning of the of the movie starts with a scene of two men and a woman on a couch, and they're having a chat. And the one is a, a, arguing for the existence of God, and the other one comes back with the very cliche, "Yeah, you know, well then, who created God?" Mm -hmm. 
Okay, fine. So we have the you know, so he establishes the character, the director as the um as the movie's atheist. But then the whole rest of the film is pre you know, presupposes a spiritual dimension <laughs> and these malevolent forces that are operative unseen. I so I, I think there is a deep hunger and a deep intuition that there are levels to reality that are unseen, but no less real because of it. I mean, the, whether we profess in the Nicene Creed, we believe in things visible and invisible. Uh, William James, uh, you know, his, you know, the father of American psychology has this, you know, the varieties of religious experience. And he arrives at the end and, to say like, yeah, there is something like there are levels of reality that we we need to get into touch with that par part of our well-being to be religious is to be in congress with and i think that the sacramental dimension of christianity and catholicism especially gives us tangible tactile um, ways of being in literally in touch with mm -hmm. the divine Mm -hmm. In a way, it, 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 you could say it's almost primordial. Like mm -hmm. this, you know, we we have a, a felt sense of the the conflict between good and evil, and that a force for good, the transcendent, is in some way on our side and able to uh, negate, push back against the boundaries of darkness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's always it's still quite funny that it, that and The Exorcist is probably the best film to do this. That it's always the last thing, and this is something that I'm trying to write about recently as well with respect to people converting and coming back to god in the very secular age is that like you sort of you have this thing of like right well you know when you find meaning in life you start with material like get a fast car get a nice house and you go, ah, still haven't got meaning i'll try i'll t like i'll try a group or some club or something and do that still haven't got meaning i'll try an alternative religion doesn't mm -hmm. really it works for a little bit and then you try like a more serious alternative religion or something and then you might go to like one of the big monotheistic religions, but it, but it, but it's still consumerist in the sense. But, it, but 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 it is that, but not really. It's our special one. And then the last resort, you go, oh, okay, I'll, I'll be I'll become Christian, right? The thing of your youth or whatever, thing of your your heritage in a way. And it's the same with possession. The Exodus is a great case where they go, well, it's something in her brain, and then they go through to like it's something in her spine, I think, and then and then finally they have this big group meeting of the doctors in The Exorcist, and you see this one sort of begrudgingly go, are you a, are you a do you believe in God? You know, like they they like yeah okay, well the yeah. last thing, and it's really interesting to me that even in that sense, there's still this notion that at least we can all, there's still a cultural agreement that that could at least be an option. Like the apathy hasn't gone so far where we where possession isn't even a thing anymore. Like it's still a thing, like just holding on. You're right. I think there's this bizarre reductive impulse, you know, is we talked back in, what was it? February, February I think, yeah. you know, I've been, I, I have a writing leave next semester. I'm going to be working on, on, a project involving horror and as part of my research and i always feel like i'm a i'm a bad researcher because i read the things that i like and i follow you know i try to go where the honey is so i recently read uh, matthias Klassen's like why horror seduces mm. or um aaron smuts the late aaron smuts uh but the problem i've had with their their work is it's so reductive Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like the, the the approaches that we see in The Exorcist, where, well, it can't be that, it can't be that. You, what Mary Midgley called nothing buttery. Oh, it's nothing but a brain tumor. It's nothing but epilepsy. It's nothing but a, some form of mental illness. It's nothing but uh, your repressed sexual urges for your parents or whatever it's going to be. But you're right that we we sort of remove those objections and is however improbable it may seem to the characters, at least there's an opening mm. to a tra the transcendent. I mean, it's there's a weird way in which those films enact or perform the purgation of the spiritual life, but they do so by removing this mental clutter of all the supports and structures we think you know they they maintain our world picture mm. as those collapse rather than fall into total, you know, uh, uh, be buried under the debris, there must be something there. There are, it, oddly, 
the good horror movies profoundly anti-nihilist mm-hmm. because by raising the ground of 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 all this the human created supports we risk coming into contact with a force not of our own making mm-hmm. but one that is very real and presses itself upon us yeah it's interesting i mean i remember last time you 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 mentioned that horror it really presents a negative not negative theology but a negative image of theology right and hellraiser does this especially where the cenobites and the lead cenobite uh pinhead which is sort of yeah. weird that that's his actual name but he's trying to in a way present himself as the christ figure if it was completely the world flipped upside down and he's always in a way he's always struggling because he doesn't have there isn't and the, the only thing they don't have is a negative grace so they don't have something and so it's always this self-built all they really have is pain um and it's interesting you know you mentioned that it's a negative purgation so the purgation which is brought about by i guess by spiritual life is you yourself shedding things away because you're trying to move closer to god and you're trying to move closer to love whereas the negative image is we have to keep moving away all the horrible stuff to get through to that but both places i guess arrive at the same location which is hope but via horrible one via horrible means so eventually you have this like final hope which is quite a nice way of putting it i mean it's not nice for for reagan and the exorcist but nice. it's but it is a hope and i guess i guess the horror the, maybe the horrifying thing is maybe and maybe a horror film needs to do this would be the like the exorcism doesn't work that would be interesting where do you go then Right, because because it, it's the the acknowledgement of this is the final this is the final thing. Like if this doesn't work, then we're really in completely unknown territory. But it always works. <laughs> yeah, well, you're right. In, I mean, like take take even The Exorcist. Um, I know we didn't necessarily bring this one up, but like Exorcist Two, <laughs> yo, she, yo, she's brought into the labyrinth. And the names, I mean, I saw this about six months ago. So the heroine and the young woman, the blonde girl, they're in this labyrinth. And at the heart of the labyrinth is Leviathan. And this transcendent, you know, it is above and beyond. And it seems to be uh, manipulating that underworld, the upside down, if we want to go Stranger Things type Mm -hmm. imagery. We have this Leviathan that is the dark uh, the version of the dark transcendent Mm -hmm. and it is malevolent and it is destructive and corruptive of the flesh Mm -hmm. but then you know as you put it the the obverse would be say uh john of the cross and the spiritual canticle Mm -hmm. the bride's cry the wound the heart wounded by love goes out on its pilgrimage in search of love in search of the beloved for whom the heart longs so like an augustinian itinerary but there that transcendent love is wooing you you're always being drawn and throughout the world as you grow more attuned and aware of the divine traces you are drawn deeper and deeper by love to love Mm -hmm. and i think and, and that's the transformative so even the the transformative process that although purgative although you know and purifying it is such to recreate us in the image and likeness of the beloved that we are drawn into this into the perichoresis of divine love and and we uh, to join that divine conspiracy of the trinity whereas in in the exorcist or in uh, hellraiser one and two that diabolical power it is dividing people mm. it it transforms the flesh but not into communion but quite quite actually division and they're they're less human they're less themselves uh they, they're more i guess i don't know the the, the graced you know the, the the graced body of the, ris- the of the risen christ stands quite opposite to the 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 the, the wounded pain flesh of the chatterer or pinhead you know it's they're just two very different things mm, mm. it's 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 um it's fantastic because it's it's this especially with hellraiser i mean hellraiser is the great i mentioned this with colby dickinson where he says um theologically christianity is always a theology of disappointment because you'll never fully get to the thing that you want and 
really until you're dead, hopefully, right? Maybe the presence of God or the, you see the face of God, the beatific vision. You, you aren't going to get that now, but there's always, really what's drawing that on is hope. The inverse of this is still a disappointment, but it's like a pure disappointment because with Hellraiser, I mean, Pinhead, as I said, I mean, he's, he, he is, he's always in the admittance of like, all, all we really have is pain. And, and his, uh, especially in the, in the book, The Hellbound Heart, and actually, if you haven't, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but the latest Hellraiser, which has a real emphasis on the theology and on Leviathan and this like just need to keep going further, is this talk about like, oh, you should see what we can do with your nerve endings, right? Like they finally got it down to the most pain of pain. Yeah. But then Pinhead's almost almost saying like, we haven't really got anything more than pain and pleasure where pain is broach to such a degree that it becomes pleasure but then you go okay but where where then and all he's all he's got is suffering because that's the limit of material existence is suffering so he's like we'll just keep pushing that but then it's like okay but where then you know they haven't they haven't got anything so their eternity is just we'll just keep torturing you and finding new ways to cause suffering which is just an odd disappointment well you know it's funny because what is the set i mean for the Christian imagination, it's the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ that that becomes the the gravitational center. Mm-hmm. A passio, I mean, a suffering, mm-hmm. a pa- you know that we under that there's an undergoing of Christ, and then as you know of John of the Cross again, the spiritual canticle uh, to be wooed by the beloved is to be drawn beneath the shadow of the cross to mm-hmm. join the one you love. But that pathic structure of the Christian life is duplicated but corrupted within the horror film because it's suffering. To mm. what end? You know, it's it, it, you know, Johann Baptist Metz will talk about like Leiden on God, like it's to suffer unto God. Mm. Mm-hmm. But to whom does Pinhead suffer? For whom? Unto whom? You know, it's, there's there's just suffering. It's not redemptive, it is not transformative and it's not to say that we suffer because it's good mm. but i think all gro- in all authentic growth and maturation there is a suffering and undergoing as one is retuned or and transformed over time but in hellraiser it it is just an interminable suffering it's pain for the sake of pain, mm. but it's not to do anything other than the only feeling one can have, I guess. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's terrifying. Mm. I guess it's terrifying. The, the, ter- the suffering isn't terrifying in its, in its sense, but it's, it's terrifying in the sense that the teleology is Pinhead saying, to, you know, Pinhead, you know, the most probably one of the most famous quotes, you know, do not cry. Your tears are a waste of good suffering. And you, I guess yeah. you think to yourself, but a waste a waste for whom like f- literally suffering for suffering and i guess that's the horror is oh like this is we're just doing this for its own sake um which yeah. is yeah suffering for a purpose has has meaning so it is it's like it's a uh, is it a physical a physical representation of nihilism we have nothing else but to do so we will we'll just suffer and we'll just keep suffering why that's the horror of that but there's no why there you go deal with it <laughs> I mean, again, the, the obverse of Angelus Silesius, you know, the why create Onevarum? It is without a why, out of love. Mm. The, the mystery of being, love. Or there is or, no why. It's just there. You know, it's an unanswered question not to be grappled with, only to be grasped by and 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 not even fully immolated. You just linger. It's nerve endings you know, mm. provoked and antagonized for eternity. The, you know, the negative image of, of the beatific vision. Mm. And it's, it, and that's a really a great encapsulation of, you know, the, the, the one sort of actual definition we have of hell from Christ, which is eternal separation from God is really eternal separation from love. And I guess when you don't have love, it's not necessarily the suffering you know, I I always thought there was a disappointment as well with Hellraiser that they should have they should have gone more psychological. You know, the flesh the flesh stuff. Sometimes you think, oh, another another hook going through skin. Like, okay, we got it now. Yeah. I wanted I. It sounds a bit masochistic, statistic in a way, but I wanted to see what happens when you push the psychological horror to its limit, where someone's just I don't know put in a room and they go, they've been there for a thousand years, which I think is done well in Black like Black Mirror and twilight zone and things like this where people are pushed to their psychological limit because i think that's the real hell right flesh gets flesh flesh with no immolation as you said gets boring you go okay 
We get, we get it. You, you've 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 flailed someone again. <laughs> yeah. Saw and hostile. Yeah. It, and there they get the psychological and the physical, but they don't. I mean, it's you don't really get the. I I have never found anything spiritually provocative or interesting about hostile, other than to say like, well, this is very negative anthropology. This what <laughs> is this what we are capable of? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in in back to the secular secular world idea. I mean, it, 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 it's the, like the cliche horror question, but maybe it's not often asked in a theological sense. Why why do we have this? obvious fascination with when we step into a horror film we're going to get down we're going to get down to it right we're going to get into that weird little zone that we all intuit is there why do we have this fascination with the occult the hidden the the devil the 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 spooky stuff of reality i think about this a lot like why do i like it and there's certain i know i'd like to think i have a fairly eclectic set of tastes when it comes to to horror you know, horror is the genre that that it, it names the genre that and what it tries to do to inculcate a sense of horror or dread and what is horror i mean in some ways i i look at it's it's our emotional affective physical response to a breach in the world as we understand it that there is something intruding upon us that is a threat that is harrowing. And I mean, I, I, I believe still um, uh, Carol's, the, Noel Carroll's The Philosophy of Horror gets this better than most, that there's something cognitive and evaluative that's going on. But it doesn't go much. I mean, it, it, in some ways, he's drawing back on, on Rudolf Otto and the numinous, that there is something it's translated as non-rational, but I think we would say you know, su- not super rational, but over-saturating mm. uh, that is beyond our ability to comprehend. Mm. And that horror is one way of putting us in touch with that, something we intuit natively, mm. that there's more, there's more to reality than meets the eye. Mm-hmm. And in other eras, when we had a common narrative, say in the a Christian Western narrative, where we had a common vision of our teleology, we don't need, maybe we don't need the horrifying to, to reawaken a sense of, of the transcendent or the unseen. As we, as we move, say, from 1500 to the year 2022, that, that's changing, that our sense of a common teleology has collapsed. Uh, we've become, you know, the the canons of the Enlightenment, which I think are important, uh, but you know, to to move away from immaturity to a form of maturity, but that's it's just at the time of of of, of Kant and what is Enlightenment, what 1783, 20 years before you have Horace Walpole writing uh, the Castle of Otranto, and as we have moved through the you know modernity and such. Uh, you, you see this dawning of interest in the unseen order mm. uh, that's around us. So I think it, I, I think just anthropologically, we're constituted to be in, in touch with the infinite and the transcendent. And that the horror is one way of reopening those clogged passages that uh, our, our secular narrative uh has closed off or you know rubbled over for, for traditional religions but there are still avenues to pursue them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i guess what you what you're saying there about this sort of saturation of reality or like a hyper reality it makes me think of david lynch so david david foster wallace he comments about people say david lynch is a surrealist but he, he talked about how surrealism is really like sir realism it's like the extra thing on realism it's like hyper realism and i think lynch is the the master of this right i mean not not even in the weird stuff that the, the really horrible stuff that he does in with that horrible creature behind the bin in uh yeah um i can't remember the name of the film lost the film but his masterwork with the camera where he'll just linger on a shot for just yeah. too long and you're sat there thinking like please move away because we all intuit that there's just something more going on here or he'll just zoom in for like 20 seconds and you just think i don't want to i don't want to go that deep into reality right now yeah. and that that intuitive sense of there's something more, but we don't really give it 
give it the time, I guess. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's Sartre, right? Like in uh, Nausea, that there's that there's this way of lingering. And I, oh, I think horror is a one opportunity. It's going to a horror film on a, on a Friday night or Saturday night. It's communal. There's something about going to behold this uh, iconic depiction, depending, it may be iconic, uh, that in some way it's that we're going because we want to experience something. We want the film to implicate us within its telling. And it, I think a good horror film asks us to dwell, as you're saying, on features of reality or features of the world that we often look past too quickly. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's sort of, it, it's a disruption that invites us to look into the breach and ask, what do we really see? Is, I, I you know, in the middle of the night, I hear, I hear glass breaking in my house. Now in the daytime, I think, oh, the cat knocked it over. Mm -hmm. But at night, all of a sudden, I can conjure up all of these images of a dark and malevolent force that is breaking it upon me. Well, there's something about that. Uh, what if, what if there is more to reality, that this isn't all there is? And I think, I think horror films become our quasi monstrances to go sacramental again, that mediate that encounter and provoke us uh, to consider. This, I mean, that, that, that idea of light and dark and literal light and dark, like you said, like the glass breaks in the day, you don't think anything of it, but at night your, your mind suddenly is like, there's a thousand and one things. This for me was pointed out after the first time after I watched Rosemary's Baby, I remember thinking, why is that so unnerving? And I was reading around and someone basically just pointed out, said that the reason Rosemary's Baby is this masterwork of horror is pretty much none of the film takes place in darkness. And in fact, the, the director, Go, uh, Polanski, emphasizes the fact that I think pretty much the only scene, and there's probably some psychoanalytical commentary on this, that takes place in the dark is uh, when early on her and her lover have sex in the flat and they turn off the light. Other than that, yeah. all the horror is he makes sure that it's like, this is fully lit. You get to see everything. And yet all the time you have this sense of, yep, something's here. I don't really like it. So it's almost like St. John of the Cross is darkness, but you're fully in it and you can see, which is even more horrifying. It's a, yeah, a quotidian evil. <laughs> I mean, today, by today's standards, I would, I would imagine if I showed Rosemary's Baby, it was too long to put into our course mm. as a film. My students would not find it. They would not initially find it scary because it doesn't have the jump scares. It doesn't have the uh, over the top. But I think that's a you made that, that that's a great observation. Like it is all done except for the one scene within within daylight. It's 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 ambient lighting, mm. and what is evil and at work does so under the cover of it, 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 in the daylight. It's not. It's not creeping behind the bookshelf waiting to jump out at you. It is rather, it's here and in our midst. Mm. You know, it's, it's active and present. It's beguiling, as, as we see with Guy, but it is also uh, hostile and transformative and evil. And, yeah. And she can't get away. I mean, you know, there's like, I think that my favorite scene is there when, when she finally thinks she's gone to a doctor who can, who is outside of what, whoever's, you know, pulling the strings. And then all of a sudden the doctor says, oh, just wait here a minute. And then you're waiting for some, like, this is the final hope. And then all of a sudden, all the people who are in on it say, Rosemary, you know, what are you doing? And, and you know, at that point, it's like, it's, it, okay, yeah. it's gone. She's gone. It, well, she's just lost full control. Yeah. And you see the, the 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 shunting aside of religion. I mean, there's the you know, the, the visit of the Pope, her flashbacks of, of of Catholic her Catholic education, her Catholic upbringing. But the guy sort of laughs it off. And where is where is God in all of this? I mean, I think that's even more chilling that that the Antichrist can have a child, can that can become flesh. Mm. And all these nice old people, like the people you sit next to at church on a Sunday or they go to the four o'clock supper, are gathered around and they are agents of evil ushering in. And she 
has her conversion mm. like a mother's a mother's love still and she reaches out and rocks the cradle i mean that's terrifying mm. the it's not even the well hannah Arendt's the banality of evil i was about to say yeah <laughs> you know, a bunch of people gathered around the bassinet just to to coo at the baby it's quite funny in a way right that 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 in itself is the neg negative image of daily Catholicism or daily Christianity, right? At the end of mass, you have, you know, the polite old ladies bake the cake again and you all sit around and have a nice chat about tea. And they're all <laughs> sitting around, they're acting, all the people in Rosemary's Baby in that final scene are all acting, like they, they sort of look at her like, well, you know, it's after, it's after mass, right? We're just having our tea. It's like, yeah, the, baby, the baby's over there, right? And it's, yeah. it's that, that emphasis on like the one person who is completely filled with that dread of this is not, something is going on here and you guys just aren't seeing it and yeah they they don't they don't want to see it which which i guess it brings me to a question because the devil the devil plays a role in rosemary's baby which is um basically elusive he's not really he's not really there he's just in the background like pulling the strings and making sure everything everyone played their role i mean it's probably a very banal question but as a as a priest and a jesuit i mean where do you what film do you think gets the devil right what do you think film have you finished and you think that was a, the best encapsulation of the devil I've seen Oof. so the, again, the, it's, it'll be cliche but I want to bracket the dramatic ending of The Exorcist mm -hmm. but if you if you read the, the novel mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you have next to you St. Ignatius of Loyola's Rules for Discernment. Mm -hmm. There are four parts to the novel The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. You can index the rules for discernment as if it, it is as if William Peter Blatty had had those rules to talk about how the evil spirit is at work in a human's mm -hmm. life. The way that it, the way it is, it sows doubt and discord. The way it is corruptive. Uh, the, the, I think, I think that book and then the movie shows that the negative effect that we become, you know, that that evil is a dehumanizing, inhumanizing force. It's making us less human. The seductive power of evil. You know, worship me, and I will give you all of this when it touches the human flesh is corruptive mm. and it it's isolating and it's vile and vulgar and profane. You, you could take, I, to be honest, it, the best horror movie of, if you want to see the, the work of evil at work, the very best movie, the original, the lion King, <laughs> because Scar, look at scar versus Mufasa. You see, you see Mufasa the lion, the the, the intelligi, the achieved reality of what a lion should look like. Mm -hmm. Heroic, majestic, powerful. And then you have Scar. And this is a world where, you know, we we don't see one lion eat another. We do see one lion kill his brother. It's at least alluded to. But then um, you, you have Simba, T Timon and Pumbaa eating the grubs. That's a genocide. And we take it for granted. Like, oh, it's cute and funny because they're eating all these grubs. Well, they, all those little creatures lost their lives. We, the, the nature of evil, that it becomes a commonplace. Mm. Mm -hmm. And the way it affects Scar, he's deteriorated and wizened and small-spirited, pusillanimous. I mean, I think those are, for me, that's the, 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 the trace of evil. It doesn't come in glitter and gold. It comes in this small-souled cruelty, myopia, mistrust, divisive. Uh, and that's it becomes the opportunity for discernment of how is this leading me away from being a fully flourishing uh, human? Mm. And I guess, yeah, The Exorcist is that that example of Reagan being really, you know, the, the, in a way, the, the cliche, sweet young girl, like the, the, the absolute uh opposite of a demon but then yeah. as you say the 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 inability for the demonic in the sense that it corrupts you know the the human being being the image of god the soul soul being breathed into the human being by god and being quite literally you know uh, uh yeah the image of god the demon coming face to face that is like it's like in the, in the flesh suit but unable to 
to do like all it can do is ruin it um because yeah. it just can't be a human it can't be humble and there you have you, the, the the pivot from exorcist one ex, ex, exorcist three you know damien Karras, come into me come into me hear the a perversion of maranatha you know come lord jesus you know come into me take me as possession mm -hmm. and then we see what that looks like decades a well, decade and a half later mm -hmm. in, in in the third movie um and the minute that pazuzu does inhabit karis's body you see reagan her voice returns she becomes herself again and you see it in the rictus of of, of, of karis that before he propels himself out the window you know that that final moment of conflict the one the, the most conflicted soul in a way throughout the movie because we watched his internal wrestling i mean reagan Reagan was a, an easier victim. And here, the willing victim who, who throws himself out the window. Yeah, you know, this is... Yeah, I mean, I think it's theologically rich and very suggestive work. Yeah, I mean, Blatty, Blatty clearly did a lot of research for that. And I, I, I think it's a testament to Jason Miller's acting that even though you're, as the viewer from the, the third position, completely aware that, you know, Damien Karras is, is sort of having... He's questioning his own faith. Um, he's having a complete spiritual crisis but at the same time they still trust him as like the advisor to all these other priests who are having spiritual crisis so like as a as a viewer it's amazing because you're you're and this balancing act of i completely trust this guy but i also know that he could not win here because he's he's in his most vulnerable but you still yeah. you still trust him more than this the 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 other priest i've i feel this anyway at least who the other one who's doing the the rite of exorcism exorcism with him you feel like i know I, I trust damien here to get through this more for some reason i don't particularly know why but yeah that that undercurrent of all of this has just been a ploy to try destroy karis's faith basically and yeah. and and at the end it's like Ray, you know they say reagan doesn't remember thing it's almost like psh, done like demons demons done with her you know Car yeah. we got we got karis karis is now well you don't know this is nexus one but locked up and is basically just chained to a bed. Yeah. And then it, you and even the conquest of Lancaster Marin. I mean, you assume, I remember maybe watching it the second time. I watched it when I was young, like a kid, watching it, and you think, wow, Lancaster Marin, like here he is, you know, this authority, this powerful figure, spiritual guru, he has experience. But even then, I mean, there's there's a there's a way in which the film plays on this sociophobic that we believe that religion will redeem and it doesn't <laughs> like that, that 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 if it, that it, could religion be irrelevant impotent and it would seem as such lancaster marin can't do it and and the uh, and weirdly the ritual doesn't work mm -hmm. it's only the invitation it's not the in, invoking the exorcism ritual. It's the invitation of Karis to you know, to to swap himself, mm -hmm. to lay down one's life mm -hmm. for someone who's not even his friend. You know, I think that's yeah. I, I've not thought of that aspect of it here until now. But you could take that. I mean, there's so much that goes on. And I remember when we watched the, the film in class, the the students really grooved on. Um, trying to find meaning or discern and discover what was going on in the in the, the cinematic text, and this, yeah, I wish I could teach it again. <laughs> so the film, which is the film, in a way, then is 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 sort of a failure, right? Like the whole thing is somewhat of a failure, other than like, okay, so you know, like you said, that impotent feeling of okay, Reagan survived, but like, what we haven't, we haven't really had any closure. I mean, in Exorcist One, you you understand that Karis is dead, which I assume would mean the demon dies with the body or whatever but and then you go through to three but but in that initial film if you were to keep that without three it's like okay I, you know not really sure what happened there in a way like it was this yeah failure you, it, 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 and at the same time <laughs> the, one of the great successes is that it doesn't explain it does not overreach in its explanatory power mm -hmm. How do we get from an archaeological excavation 
to Georgetown. Hmm. Why the why the Ouija board? You know, a hmm. dark portal uh, that mediates a sinister encounter. All right, but why Reagan? It doesn't. It the movie doesn't overstep its bounds to try to make sense of everything. And there it, it, it recognizes with integrity the mystery of evil, that it's not something to be explained away. Mm-hmm. And even the end of the film, I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't cliche in trying to suggest, okay, now stay tuned for the, the sequel. You It just, it ended. Mm-hmm. We assume Karis is dead, but as we learn in Exorcist 3, that's not true. Uh, but that's exciting. You know, the, the, it, that the, the level of the openness to the mystery of the events hasn't been evacuated. Mm-hmm. And on that level, so it's it's a failure on one side, it's a success. I mean, so it's, a, mm-hmm. I think that makes it a good film. It, it reminds me just to, just to throw it in with the same, the same balance. And, and I had to, someone, someone actually explained this to me recently that I don't know if you know this, but to draw in Tolkien, which seems like an odd person to draw, draw in with the end of the Lord of the Rings and Return of the King with respect to this this horror and this failure. Someone explained to me that deep in the lore, uh, deep in all Tolkien's massive tombs of details of his world, there's only three times that Luvatar, basically God, intervenes in that world. And one of them is when the ring goes into the fire. So Luvatar, God actually trips up Gollum. So that the whole thing was a failure. Like it never, evil never would have been destroyed and God eventually has to go trip them up so like frodo has had this horrible you know evil taint with the scar and to go back to the shire that's been ruined they all have to go and live their own lives like they'll never get rid of it god had to intervene and say look you i'm gonna have to get rid of the sin for you and it's like you sort of have this like peter jackson fair enough he had to make a blockbuster but there isn't that sense of like oh man we did we did we win you know that the, the evil is still like sprayed its horrible stench over everything and everyone's still like yeah yeah we don't want to think about that anymore <laughs> well but, but isn't that the th- i mean a, for me for me mm. a good horror film leaves its residue mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just as okay you're now a catholic so you you go to confession and you walk out and you feel cleansed mm-hmm. i mean there is it is a feeling unlike any other i know to walk out Lessened of a burden, illuminated, invigorated, renewed. It has a, the spiritual, the, the the just the invoking of words. That formula of absolution is transformative. By contrast, when I walk out of a good horror film, I'm like, if it's good, I'm putting the key, the keys in the car, and I'm I'm looking over my shoulder. Mm. I'm wondering as I drive home. What more could there be in this world? What else is at work? There's, there's still state. There remains an opening to more. So my, like my theological imagination, is more deeply enkindled mm-hmm. by that, by because it's raising questions that there are for there, that there are things out of my control, mm-hmm. out of our control as humans, and that I think is what gets me. Um, it does. It, it, it sort of it levels a charge against the audience. You think you're in control. You think that you've got this under under uh, your power. Not so, not so. Mm. It's interesting because I think maybe that's the backbone of good and bad horror is control and complete human control. So with with religion, I think I always, or with Christianity, I think some people's reluctance is that in a sense you're, giving over positive control to god right like grace is you can't you can't go run on a treadmill and work up grace right you can't you yeah. don't you don't earn it you can't buy it you you get it and you may get it someone who's maybe uh extremely sinful may get loads you know if you want to quantify it which is a bad way to do it but for, i'm basically saying you you can't control grace you can't control that hope which is going to come in and uh, maybe that's what makes a, a, a bad horror film is like the humans just completely well, we 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 figured it out, right? Like a rational a rational finish, and you think, well, that's just awful. Whereas that that unknown, it was on a knife's edge at the the whole point. Yeah, there's you. you I think a good horror film. Yeah, I'm thinking like Burger and Luckman, the social construction of reality. That there's a gnomic function 
within our symbolic universe, that there's a law that has to be abided by, mm -hmm. that disruptions to that law, that nomos, have um, dire consequences mm -hmm. for the way we live. But we ourselves are neither the architects nor the ultimate enforcers of that law. That there is, that there were other, I keep using the word forces, but there's a divine force at work to undergird, to, to author and to, to maintain that law. Disruptions of it call, require some form of redemption. And maybe good for it, there is an element of the redemptive story of being of a power not again of our control that has to intervene or break through or be allowed to break through to manifest itself again the sacraments uh sacraments got you know got god doing what god always tries to do you know to feed to clean to heal to bind together that that, that there's a sacramental uh countermeasure taken uh, to undo the, the the damage wrought by the dark. Mm. Do, you, do you think we can really consider a horror film a horror film if it doesn't have at least some sincere respect for a divine or a, uh, I want to say other other plane, maybe other place that beyond, you know, some like a clear, we're taking it seriously that there's some, some, some more. So I would be, I, I, I'm, it's hard to say. Mm. You know, the, but when when Noel Carroll's book came out, that was uh, he he was very specific in in talking about like monsters that a horror movie has to have a monster in it, and it has to uh, be it has to elicit like disgust and revulsion, and that seemed to preclude films like Saw, Hostel, The Silence of the Lambs from being a horror film. You could take more psychoanalytic approaches, the approach of like evolutionary psychology, and try to do a really reductive version of horror. And I think that you could you can then spread out the definition of horror uh, more broadly. For my money, I think the best horror films do have an appreciation for the implicit metaphysical world picture that that we have a way that we envision the world to operate under normal laws we have a sense of good and evil of what things or people ought to do so we have a teleological sensitivity and that horror is deliberately interrupting those expectations or or overthrowing them and part of the the narrative is how do we what works how is that breach repaired and that's part. I think part of the tension it creates is recognizing the breach, what the, the the breakdown, and wondering how does this get fixed if it can't be fixed at all. I, yeah. So I think I, I do think you have to have some. I think the '80s you see really interesting, um, much more theologically sophisticated uh, filmmaking, even if the implicit, oh, usually implicit. I think Hellraiser. Is, he's not writing with a Bible in his hand, but I think he de Clive Barker certainly has uh, an imagination that's been touched. Stephen King, John uh, John Carpenter, Wes Craven. I think that there's there's a lot going on there, mm. uh, but we just have to kind of open our eyes to see it, and then you could almost evangelize out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that that, that those you know I, I thought this when I sent over the film choices to you that it, that that era sixties through to eighties which is also the rise of sort of pulp paperback rise of, you know, every other kind of weird mystical meditation or peculiar 60s thing that people were abiding by. There, there was this sort of imbued sense of something more, I think, in that era and taking it seriously. And I mean, Clive Barker in, in The Hellbound Heart, which is one of the things I wish they'd sort of left in the movie, but when he first calls, takes the box and calls the Cenobites to come, he's actually laid out an altar filled with basically inversions of the the altar in a christian church there's like a bowl of doves heads and all these images of you know anti-innocence and things like this and yeah this 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 need for something more but the the, the yeah just the but once again that that the fact that these films are being written with this this compulsion for something more but also the characters don't want that something more to be god which is always peculiar to me 
like why that yeah, is. That's why I think, that, um, for my money, a, a horror film can work as a really great lab. Mm. You're looking at specimens. You're looking at forms of you know, what, what are the a priori convictions that characters hold about the way the world is, what counts as evidence, what matters most. Mm. And we can you can diagnose versions of of reductive materialism or, you know, what William, my guy, William Desmond will call like postulatory finitism. Well, no, the only thing that matters is matter and what I can see and manage and measure fine. But you, you, in many horror films, you see that it's pushing past the limits of human reason. And that's even by, by displaying our finitude, uh, over against a horizon of the infinite, I, I think there's something that that's, that that puts us at ill. It makes us ill at ease and forces us to reconsider again and again and again our place in the universe. They're like existential. They're, they're invitations to existential reflection. Um, I don't think deliberately. I don't think a, a, an author or director is sitting out to to do that deliberately. But I think that's the function that they that they have. Mm. I was going to ask that. Do you think, you know, like the question of what, what actually, you know, the whole, what actually is it we're going to see when we go see a horror film? Like, what do we think? What do we, I guess, deep down, we're thinking, I, I want my existential dread to be like pushed a bit, right? Because I don't think yeah. when I go see a horror film, I don't think to myself, I want to see someone like chopped up because that doesn't, it doesn't really interest me unless that's for some deeper reason. I, that would, that would bore me. I don't want to see really like, a, I'm not interested in werewolves because it's like, it's just a big, like, it's a big dog. It's not, it's not, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not, it's not scary at all. Like if you had it in yeah. front of you, you'd think, yeah, okay. Like we'll just shoot it or something. Like that's not scary to me. So you, you are implicitly thinking with Hellraiser, you're not thinking I want to go see all the pins dragged through his head, even though that's some part of it. And there's, there's something there. You're, there's that deeper thing of, I want this to push the unknown. I want it to somehow show me the unknown, which is like the complete paradox, right? Show me the unknown somehow. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, look at, I mean, I still think, I, I mean, I find clowns creepy, but Pennywise, look, in the storm drain, in the, sh in, 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 in the sink, you know, drain, mm. in the shower drain, in the movie uh, under the water in the flooded basement, in the, you know, down a, a well that you have to go through to get to his catacombs. You know, you think about the, the, the what is, the clowns are cute for, to some people and they're supposed to be fun, but they're in this case, this it, it can see the, the facade conceals something unknown and hostile. And, and, and he becomes, you know, a, a really an inf like an infernal icon, the face of the clown, the, the hockey mask, the scarred face of Freddy Krueger, the mask of Michael Myers that it, we gaze on and it sort of looks back at us and it forces us to wonder, am I being watched? Mm. Am I alone in this wood? Am I alone in the house? It's not what I know that scares me. It's what is unknown. And now I know that I do not know that the unknown might be just behind me. And mm. that is, yeah. I mean, I, like you, I mean, I, the beginning of um, the exorcist, you know, he, he has narrative and one of them, is of a, a mafia who torture a man for I think like three days and apply electricity to his body parts and mm -hmm. you know humiliate him and such. Why, why start with that? I mean, the the the, the terror of real life is already bad enough, and then he's going to walk us into a work of ostensibly fiction. Mm -hmm. But it, it, what what mediates between our day to day, the quotidian? And the fiction that we enjoy in the theater like i'll go to see the movie terrifier 2 although i'm quite confident i'm not gonna like to see all the the blood guts and gore mm -hmm. i can go watch a mafia movie to see people dismembered i'm just hoping that there's something more exploratory about mystery in the film mm -hmm. or i'll just go because i want to have a laugh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's it's that idea of being followed is interesting. I mean, have you have you seen Insidious? Yes. Yeah. See now, Insidious. I don't. I don't rate 
jump scares in films generally i think jump scares is the cheapest form of horror it's like you know they've they've made you go ooh, yeah but it's like well yeah of course you did you, you just quickly put a scary face on the screen like of course it's going to make yeah. me jump that's not impressive but there's this amazing thing that i think james one does in insidious as a director is that idea of the demon following or just the demon being in the room he does like a shot where like the demon's just there and you've had time to process it and then does the jump or he'll just suddenly one shot for five seconds the demon is in the corner of the room and then no one says anything about it and i think that is that is the um, uh, as the viewer and the, this idea of one of the women i think in the conjuring being a clairvoyant and knowing the demon is there this idea that one of the characters can just see the demon all along is like yeah the demon you know so, and then she she relays this later on in the film she's like yeah since we arrived i've just been seeing it and this idea of being able to put the demon or whatever it is in front of you and still understanding that you are not in control that is that yeah. for me is the perfect horror which i think it's all it encapsulated in in all those films that there's always it's like there's something there we can't do anything about it and now we've got to sit through this sort of painful realization process now, tell me when did you find yourself interested in horror when did you know that this was something that i i ever since i've been young i didn't really realize this till recently till another horror writer who i interviewed a while ago pointed it out he said that he's been interested in horror ever since uh, animatronics at uh, at theme parks and these fascinate me um to the point where sometimes i'll watch videos of old animatronic theme park rides that have been left since the 80s mm -hmm. and the visceral feeling of disgust and horror that i get at, at an animatronic which is just a little bit not good enough and mm. something about that that's like we shouldn't have made this right yeah, i don't know just something horrible yeah but yeah uh, but but yeah there's something about horror which gives you a feeling that sort of feeling that i don't know we, we we all intuit that this isn't right or something's not right right now. How about you? I, I think that's the same. I loved the idea of being scared. <laughs> and I don't know why. You know, I, I, I don't think I was a weirdo kid. I mean, I played the accordion. That was bad enough. But the I just had the sense of I loved a good story. And I, and I think a, a good horror film well told is a very powerful, it almost becomes a parable of a world we cannot see. And it showed the possibilities of, of, of and the importance of taking seriously the unseen order. And it was only many decades later that I'm reading William James and I think, okay, but so I'm not totally warped. There is a sensitivity or an attunement to this. And I, I appreciate that um, now as an adult. And my, I know the students did too. They, Kids who loved horror movies were like, I'm not a freak. No, <laughs> it's good. You're just, I think you're just a good theologian. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, that does beg a, beg a question, actually, because you, you brought up the Enlightenment and Kant earlier on. I mean, it's a bit of a heavier question. But it's it's so clear to me reading Kant with the phenomena noumena and the idea that there's this, like, I don't know, thing we can't approach. He is 100% rationally not interested in this being like, what is it? You know, his epistemology is not... Um, in any sense imbued i don't think he's very you know he says he's talking about god i think he's terrible at talking about god and i don't even get a hint of the divine or anything like for him this is something else to be honest i feel that way i think it's very mm. mechanical but it's almost like in that sense when you like his epistemology is not really to do with that whereas the a horror of epistemology is like we're saying to kant like are you not are you not feeling this you know this this impasse yeah. Why, why are you not like terrified in a way? Yeah, the bridge between the noumena and the phenomena is crossed but from that direction inward. The advent of what is other and alien is, it is possible mm -hmm. and it must be taken account of. Yeah, I mean, it, epistemologically, <clears throat> the, the, I, yeah, it, it'd be very hard. Yeah, I mean, the monster manifests itself in a way that disrupts our given order and it undermines our sense of normality. Kant, I, I, yeah, I guess that, I mean, if he'd have a harder time accounting for that, I mean, I think he's, he invokes God, of course, you know, like, as a postulate of reason, but you know, practical reason, but we, we, we not as the one before whom we sing or dance, like as Heidegger said, um, just sort of there. 
mm. like the divine insurance policy. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's where it always fell flat for me with Kant and, and God. I just don't think I don't know. He 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 a peculiar man who I don't know what he was trying to do in that sense, right? That that he sort yeah. of tries to defend it. I I I it just comes across to me as he's an atheist and he put that in as a uh, like yeah as actually as an insurance policy textually as well like if they're going to take this seriously i need to it just always felt tacked on anyway um is there anything you'd like to add about you know theology and horror that that we haven't touched on no this has been you know it's it's just nice to actually talk to someone about this who has shares an interest you know my students they were i mean they really were fabulous but they don't talk to you as a peer right Mm -hmm. i mean they're like 20, 21 years old. And for them, their parents are the ones who like, if they like it at all, Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th. And they regard these as old horror movies. And I think, I still think that they're, the, the, a Nightmare on Elm Street is a really interesting and fun film. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's not, it, 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 there's very little, I mean, or same with Halloween. There's, mm-hmm. there's no blood in Halloween, the original. Um, uh, it's unfortunate. I think that the, the the franchise did not do Michael Myers justice. Mm. But but I I think at the end of the day, I, I think the horror gives us opportunities to think of the way the finite world can be disclosive of the infinite, and how our ability to persevere as agents as subjects rests upon how we comport ourselves vis-a-vis that infinite often enough it gives us like the negative image of of of, of evil and gives provokes us to think about it mm. but then you flip that around and you think oh so then if this is the dark path narrated by this film is there a more luminous or celestial way we could travel the way of grace, the way of hope the way you know that doesn't discount the reality of suffering and pain and the the passion but one that at least is capable or has hope enough to redeem it. So, yeah, I mean, it's like from horror to hope, from fear to faith, that sort of itinerary is what, where, where I, I think it's it's fun to speculate. Mm. That's interesting. Just to, just a, one more thing on that, this idea of like, if there's this one negative thing, then there's the other way, right? There's the up and the down, et cetera. One, you know, I'm not big on, films being just turned into extended series generally it doesn't work out all that well but hellraiser was one that i thought there's so much law here that i want to know about so there's this there's this always this intuitive sense i think they push it in quite a few films that the lamarckian configuration in the box there were mm-hmm. others which go to different realms i think that's fairly clear in the in the in the law but it's almost like what the, you know i want to know i want to know and i want to know if there is one that goes to genuine heaven right because that doesn't make sense to me that there would be this weird object that does that it just seems like the whole thing was a trick but i wanted to i want to see like what what are the other de- what are the other demons and cenobites which are pain is so obvious i guess yeah you know what what are the other ones going to do you know in well it, there's that scene at what the end of <laughs> hellraiser 48 or <laughs> i think it's <laughs> hellraiser 4 or 5 you know, where pinhead has an encounter is is, is forced to spare a human mm. and it's this celestial being who descends and then gets torn to shreds itself mm. uh by Pinhead. like sort of this divine emissary comes forward and we assume i guess that it's from god mm. you know is it is it a winged to jesus i was i should probably watch it again but where it, it says like oh you know this we this one is to be spared da, 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 da. and then Pinhead kills the the divine the luminous being it's there is, but there's lore. Like so, there is there is an, at least a tacit acknowledgement that there's something luminous, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I like you know the the thing as a as someone who likes Rene Girard, I've been mm-hmm. I'm fascinated by uh, uh, the Purge mm-hmm. series. Mm-hmm. Um, on a secular, I mean, it's almost like a Flannery O'Connor novel come to life, but without redemptive grace. I mean, there's good usually comes out at the end but it's violent and pessimistic or what roger Haight has taken to call like the the ontic pessimism of our age i think in the movies the purge series uh 
I think that's very much at play, that there is this sense of world weariness that we don't have much hope, mm. uh, the, the, the fundamental discouragement. And those films sort of like take that for granted mm-hmm. that we're just in this, this mess of, te- you know, it's just awful and bad and you have to survive, yeah. but it's not being redeemed. Whereas other, I think the more supernatural horror films are less, uh, I don't want to call it navel gazing, but they're, they take, they could take the ontic pessimism of our era and at least show how it could possibly be transformed. Yeah. This is one of the strange, um, are you good for time? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the strange, and I don't know fully where I stand with it yet, but I know you're watching Dharma at the moment. And uh, I finished up Dharma. Obviously, I can't really spoil it because we all know what what, what happens there in real (laughs) real life. Um, But this this odd fascination with serial killers where when they're turned into these these icons of consumption, and like Dharma falls into the horror genre, even though we shouldn't really say it. And like Dharma on screen... There's an, you know, we all know there's an actor, this has been written, but yeah. but there's this weird um, impasse between the reality and the thing on the screen. And so th- maybe I'm speaking for myself, maybe I'm sick in the head or something, but there's this weird like, you know, how sick is this guy going to be sort of thing, right? And we keep trying to push the boat with like, it's another serial killer series. And like, why do we want to see this? And it seems to be the same thing as The Purge of like, you know, the question of why do I want to go watch a 10 episode highly detailed retelling of this horrendous story and it is that that odd fascination of like it probably is just the question of like why like why did this happen and who is this guy that's this like anomaly of all that is human or not human but one thing um one thing i'll just add in sorry (laughs) that that really interests me and i remember getting to the end so it's the second to last episode and this isn't really a spoiler they treat redemption and baptism so sincerely and seriously at the end of Dharma, I was sort of taken aback because that they they really accept it as a given, as that it is what it is. And um, the same thing has happened to quite a few serial killers, which I find very interesting. But but I remember thinking, wow, that's quite a bold move. Um, yeah. yeah. But that that overlap yeah. between serial killers and horror is is a peculiar one, I think. Well, I mean, look at I mean, Netflix is making hay with. I mean, you have John Wayne Gacy, and there is that um. The, is it the man in gray, the fish, Albert Fish, Albert Alfred fish. fish? Albert Fish. You know, he, here you have movies made about a serial killer, and then Dahmer. I mean, and I live in Milwaukee, mm-hmm. which is, I mean, I walked by the site of the his apartment building a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, it only took a few drinks, and then we went for a walk and wanted to go canvas the hood to see where where uh, J- Jeffrey Dahmer used to to. Uh, frequent to haunt but it, it, it's funny like it, it, one of my students wrote me to suggest that i watch the series and said you know it raises for me the question like is it mental illness mm-hmm. is it something else but again mary midgley's nothing buttery is it nothing but mental illness or and i think many of us would feel better if we could say oh it's just mm. the x factor but when you in, in, in I've only seen the first three episodes, but oh, he had a hernia operation. Oh, he you, could that have done something to his head? Okay, explanatory cause. Um, a, a needy mother, emotionally unstable mother, abusive family, you know, neglectful maybe family situation. Is it nothing but a symptom of that or a symptom of that? But there's. And you always, you're left with this residue, but what if it's something else? What if there's something more? And, you know, the the Dahmer types, the Gacy's, the Bundy's, the Fish, they raise real questions for us about what it means to be human. And so, yeah, it, it's fascinating how, how people have like really, like it catches a moment mm. and holds people's attention for some time. Mm. Well, it's almost, not to trivialize it, I guess it almost is like the the real life encapsulation of Hellraiser, right? When you live in a secular, divineless, just consuming culture, you almost like, I need to watch the thing that just keeps pushing. Like, I need to see the extreme of what can happen. You know, it's like the pin, yeah. not to, yeah, it sounds trivial, but like the pin, in the sense that Pinhead only has pain. If we only have material, then it's like, I need to see the show or the thing which can just keep pushing that material. Otherwise I'm just gonna get bored. 
yeah, we have such sights to show you. <laughs> you know, this as if I mean, but, but that's our uh, consumptive, entertainment-driven society. I mean, we hunger for the the, the outlandish and the grotesque. I mean, I, again, as I said about Terrifier Two, which I will see. Uh, apparently, there it's a great marketing employee, even if, if it's not true. People vomiting and passing out and running out of theaters. <laughs> Oh, you know, sign me up. <laughs> yeah, I want to see. Like, but the, the the thing is, like, my curiosity says, what is it that's doing it, and can I withstand it? Can I? You know, it's an endurance competition. Can I allow myself to undergo it, this pathic experience, and how will I respond? Um, Has any horror, horror film ever sort of genuinely terrified you that you that's lingered with you? Your Midsummer, Midsummer has that and Hereditary. Yeah. I find both of those. I found uh, Us, mm -hmm. Jordan Peele. Um, I find I, I found those to, to have left more of a trace on my my thinking, and I don't know why. Even The Witch, a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, The Exorcist, I, maybe I'm a Jesuit because I saw that movie and I said, <laughs> all right, well, I, if, I, if these are the good guys, I'm gonna if I'm going to be a priest, I may as well be on their side. But, but those are the films that I, I, I've, I've thought more about lately. Mm. And I, I, see, I can, you know, I've, maybe it's because I've seen them more recently, but they leave me ill at ease. Mm-hmm. The purge has left me very ill at ease because I think it is it's it's a diagnostic of a general feeling. Um, yeah. Also, the fact that it's it itself as an object has become so popular, right? It almost shows this like, do you really do we all really want this odd, sadistic catharsis that that bad? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, you know, two years ago in the so twenty twenty so October on Halloween night, I was walking back. I was out for a walk. I was coming back and there's some dorms just down the street from me. And maybe it was at eight o'clock at night. Someone was playing the sound, the music, the, the, the siren <laughs> from the purge. <laughs> and I thought how, like in my, I had this horrible sinking feeling in my stomach just as I, as I heard that music, I'm like, or that sound. It's like, wow. And for those who have ears to hear, they too would have this evocation of this horrendous catharsis at the expense of innocent life and uh, the, the the marginalized of our society. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. I, yeah. The beautiful thing, I guess, with the purge, beautiful, but, but the, that odd, that odd gut moment is like, we've all got to acknowledge, you know, once the second hand, you know, it's now non-purge. It's like you're still, you're right there in front of someone who might have just blown away your neighbor's brains or whatever, right? That, like, boom. It's almost like, you know, the feeling after the exorcist where they, you know, does she remember anything? And we all have to now acknowledge, like, that sort of happened. But we, you know, that weird movement back into, well, now we're back into normal life and just moving yeah. on. There's a strange in-between space of, we're just, we still got one foot in the horror zone and we've yeah. got to somehow move forward. Yeah. And we never leave it. I mean, it, 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 like even Reagan has the, she bears the traces on her face. The family bears the trace of a, the, the butchered loved one, the, the the father who was killed and the mother who's, who the second hand saves. You know, that horror leaves a mark. Mm -hmm. It leaves a mark. You know, that's the, in the, the, the bottom of the orca when uh, Quinn and uh, Hooper and Chief Brody are talking in, J in Jaws and they're singing and telling their stories, sharing scars. Mm -hmm. And each scar points back to an event, a transformative event that lingers in memory until we get to the pathos of, of, of the shark hunter himself. Like, why do you go after the box? He was involved in this horrendous, so that... A simple like a tattoo codes for an entire life that is mm -hmm. under the surface, but is something that happened prior in life that shapes and charts the direction of life itself. Mm -hmm. So you're currently working on a book on theology and horror? 
Yeah, I think I'm just going to call it, it had been tentatively titled uh, The Dark Transcendent, uh, The Metaphysics and Theology of Horror. Mm -hmm. The problem is, it's such a big topic. That's huge. And I'm of a mind, that just to call it horror, a theology. And just to see where it goes, I have no, what's terrifying to me is I don't have a plan and I, a perfect itinerary for it. On January 1st, I will start. I don't know where it will go. I need to find a publisher. I'll have to write a couple chapters and then send it out. But it strikes me that I think the time is right for this type of book. There's lots of religion and horror and you've probably seen. There's nothing really unless you could tell me of like a theology of or I know you had given me some links, but I don't see a lot. Even mm -hmm. Brandon Gravius's new book, which is pretty good. Um, it's not a theology of course, it's scripture and this religion broadly construed mm -hmm. um, Christianity. Mm -hmm. No, I wouldn't. I know nothing springs to mind. Yeah. And that is Doug Cowan, I think is great. Sacred tear, the forbidden body. There's this, um, yeah. the gospel of the living dead Baylor puts this out mm -hmm. and this is okay I mean I thought it was a good I mean it's a fun book but it, 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 as a theologian it's I find it a little thin on the theology <laughs> and so my hope would be using like Rudolf Otto Carol even Peter Berger um Iris Murdoch the whole kid mm -hmm. like my my intellectual friends to see what <laughs> I can do I don't know if it'll work but I have a I have the, I have the semester to do something, so I may as well make it a. Yeah. I'd like to write a book that you could give to college kids in a course called, the theology of horror, mm -hmm. and let them see that you know oh there's there's something to be said for this, so that the parents aren't like, what the hell are you teaching my kid? <laughs> that they're like oh okay, the hell you're teaching my kid is pretty good because mm -hmm. it's helping them to help reignite. A sense of the divine. Yeah, no, I, th I think I think there's definitely a space for it. I mean, it's so obvious that it's it's so clear that it's there in in horror in general, but it, yeah. as you say, it needs that rigorous theological background to explain perhaps the real, why it, it is. You know, more reasons as to, but why is this on a theological level that this is so scary? Yeah, and I I, I think it needs it. It calls for reflection. I will admit, my, the what is most um terrifying about writing about horror is people take it very i mean it, it, rightly they take it very seriously mm -hmm. but my worry is how to negotiate that's why a horror a theology in some ways works better for me because you almost feel this pressure to take up the chains of the psychoanalytic approaches of the evolutionary psychologists of the then do I have to, how much of say uh, Japanese horror or non-Western, non-American horror am I tr responsible as a scholar to engage? Because mm -hmm. if you try to do everything, you will succeed in doing nothing. But if you don't do a sufficient amount of the background or the you know, other voices, you're, it's, it's not a, the project loses some of its integrity. So that's why I'm trying now to pick my constellation of topics. Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard. I find this to be the hardest part. If I could just identify the artifacts or the um, specific loci, mm. I feel much more comfortable yeah. as I set There's forth. a lot there. There's so many avenues you could easily dip into. Yeah. Well, I look forward to it. And so it's, it. it's an embarrassment. <laughs> because, well, because it's just all over the place. It's everywhere. Yeah. Is you, like the you, intuition. Yeah. I can follow an intuition. So once I start... I think the path will present itself. Okay. But you know, I mean, it's like, but like a conversion narrative. I mean, you don't know where you're going. No. You just move a little bit day by day. And then you look back and you go, ah, makes sense now. Yeah. Mm. Well, I look forward to it. Um, I'm sure you'll find a publisher and I, you know, hopefully you'll get to talk about it one day. I'd love that. Ryan love Dunce. That. It's uh, yeah, it's been great again. Thank you very much. My friend, good to see you.